I am super excited to introduce my guest. He is a veteran actor with over 35 years in show business. He's worked on over 35 feature films and countless television productions. You know, just to name a few of his credits, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, Actor Valor, Secretariat, Lethal Weapon, Hanging with the Homeboys, Bad Boys, The Negotiator, Bringing Out the Dead, Empire, The Day After Tomorrow, TV credits, True Blue, The Hat Squad, The X-Files, 24, Dexter, Homeland, 90210, Graceland, Banshee, The Last Starship, APB. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. You have way too many credits to name them all. I, I, I'm super excited to introduce Nestor Serrano to the Hollywood Dream Maker podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. And also, uh, you know, on my resume are a bunch of things that you've been on. You know, all those alphabet cop shows, uh, NCIS and the CSI and the Law and Orders and all those things that I don't think we've worked together, though, have we? We have not worked together. I wish, you know, you know, I got to tell you a quick story. So I think it was like 1985 or 86. I found out that my idol, one of in acting, Robert De Niro, was going to be doing a show on Broadway for the first time in like 15 years. He hadn't been on stage. And I was like, oh, shit, I got to go. So I literally I flew from L.A. back to New York. I got myself front row tickets to see Cuba and his teddy bear uh, with Ralph Macchio and Burt Young and a young actor named Nestor Serrano. And I was like... I was blown away just, you know, I, that's when I became a fan of you and your work, seeing you on stage, you know, fucking side by side with Robert De Niro, you know, that was, that was friggin' amazing, you know, for a young actor to see, it was so inspirational, you know, even seeing Ralph Macchio up there, you know, and, and Bert and it just, just to see you all, all you guys up there on stage doing, you know, doing what you do, it, it was just amazing. <clears throat> so just I, so you know, that, that, show sold out this is pre-internet that show sold out in two hours wow all all three months of it on broadway we did three months downtown and then three months on broadway it sold out in two hours it was a record-breaking sell up uh, you know obviously because of robert de niro but it was also uh my second most enjoyable performance that i've ever had on stage that's awesome listen i we don't know each other i we you know we're facebook friends or whatever and you know i've just been a fan and i said you know what i gotta get nestor on the show and the reason why i created this podcast is you know because I, it's to inspire you know if a, if a kid like me for come out of brooklyn new york at 18 years old with 200 bucks in his pocket and a one-way ticket, you know, coming from a broken <laughs> home, you know, ran away from home, 15, 16, running the streets, you know, doing dumb shit. And, but I, I knew in my heart, I had a dream. I knew I wanted to be an actor. And when I came out December of 15th of 1984, and I landed here and I said, I'm going to be an actor. And, and I made the dream a reality. I mean, I've been blessed. I've been in Academy Award winning films. Man, but you must have been... You, you must have been really, really young. I, I had just turned 18. Yeah. Yeah. So I just turned 18. And, you know, I was waiting for, for that 18 to kick. Yeah, I was like, you know, I'm out. <laughs> you know, I turned 18. Yesterday was my birthday. I'm, we're both. You're, happy birthday to you. I, you're November 5th. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. And, and I'm November 7th. But, you know, I turned 18 in November 7th and, like, December, I was out, <laughs> you know, I was, I was going to Hollywood, but you know, I made the dream a reality and I've been blessed and I've been a working actor for 35 years. I've been, I mean, I've, I made the dream a reality. And if a kid like me can do it, then why can't the listener do it? If a guy like you, you know, from the Bronx uh, could to, you know, do accomplish all this amazing stuff that you've accomplished. I mean, every time I turn on the frigging television, there you are, man, you know, and, and you've gone, like side by side with some of my 
favorites, my idols, you know, I mean, I grew up, you know, I'm a Pacino, you know, De Niro, you know, Malkovich. I mean, you've had the opportunity to go neck and neck with these actors. I mean, being on stage with them or working with on films with them. I mean, that's amazing. So it, it really is. It, it's been one of the most uh, pleasurable experiences of my career is working with people that I used to look up to. When I was a kid, De Niro wasn't around. It was Pacino. And I remember seeing Panic in Needle Park mm. and thinking, oh my God. And this kid was 19 at the time. Anybody out there who's listening who has not seen Panic in Needle Park, it's not a great movie. It's a good movie with a great performance from a guy who, uh, that was his first feature film. He had man. probably done, in fact, I'm sure he'd done over a hundred student films because that's what really super passionate people do is they're constantly, constantly working. And he was doing student films and had done well over a hundred student films before he did Panic in Needle Park. So he was already a veteran when he did his first movie. Uh, and he was my inspiration. In fact, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was uh, a computer operator at the Bank of New York in upstate New York. And uh, I was 18 years old, not knowing what I wanted to do, but something about computers sounded innovative. It sounded futuristic. I said, all right, I'm gonna try to get in on that. And so I left that bank because the job of a computer operator is literally, you can hire a monkey to do that. You literally press the same six buttons every day and wait for the same things to happen. And then you push another six buttons and the same thing. So I said, maybe I'm gonna be a, a, a computer engineer. And so I went to Queens College to study computer engineering. And then I realized like about an hour into it that it requires a lot of math. And I was like, what the fuck? I can't do math. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out what else to do. I'm now uh, 19. And uh, so I said, okay, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with my career, but I thought if I wanted to get laid, <laughs> I need to do some really, some like really cool stuff. So I'm e either going to join the camera club or I'm going to join the drama club. And so I chose the drama club because it's, it's a longer, you, you're hanging out with the same number of people. And I was really shy. So I thought, okay, if I get enough time to hang out with a girl, maybe I can convince her that I'm not a serial killer and maybe she'll go out with me. So that was my, my MO. And I joined the drama club and then I, I heard about these auditions for a play. And uh, I said, all right, I'm gonna audition, I guess. I don't even know what the word audition meant in the true sense of the word. I knew you had to go out there and do something, but I didn't know what it entailed. So I get in front of this director who had given me the script to the play. It was called uh, Don Peterson's Does a Tiger wear a necktie yeah Pacino did uh, which I, actually Pacino got an Obie award for that right anyway so I went in and I auditioned in front of him and I was just so just so petrified I mean I was so I was <sighs> I was soiling my pants it was bad <laughs> and the director director said, okay, okay, why, why don't you stop right there and sit down and you let me know why it is you want to do this thing. And I said, I don't know. I just wanted to get my feet wet. So I think out of pity, he gave me a role that had one line in it. And I was so passionate at that point. I said, I got to find out what this whole acting thing is about. And I'm reading, you know, all the books, all the big books on how to be an actor. And, uh, I was the first guy in to rehearsals and the last guy to leave. And I only had one line, but I was so, I just wanted to watch the process. I wanted to watch people work. I wanted to watch what the director was saying and how he communicated with the actors. So a role came up because, you know, in college, 
a, a production could be like three months long, right? The rehearsals just go on and on because you only do it one of the times you can do it. A lot of cancellations, things like that. So uh, a, a guy drew, uh, dropped out and the director said, look, um, would you be interested in uh, taking that role? And it was a better role. It was the role of Prince. He was a pimp. <clears throat> And I said, yeah, I want to do that. So I did that. And that ran for three days, November 2nd through the 4th, 5th, 5th. And uh, I said, you know, <laughs> this is how naive I was about the whole thing. I called up a friend of mine who also was in the production. And when the production was over, I, I, I called him up. I was so amped up about this whole process and how it made me feel. And I called this guy up and I said, hey, listen, um, so I'm, I've decided I'm going to be an actor. So what do I do now? And he was like, uh, you got to get an agent. You got to, you know, get yourself out there, maybe a manager. <clears throat> I had no idea just how complicated and difficult that part of the process was. Calling yourself an, an, an actor overnight is easy enough, but figuring out how to work through the business is an entirely different thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where I found myself like really, you know, coming to terms with how important is this to me? What am I gonna, you know, what, what, what's the, the energy that I'm gonna put into it? And anyway, I, I worked really, really hard in the early years of this business. And you studied. You went I over to studied Lee a lot. Yeah. But I also wanted to say, so my first, so I get out of college and I go and I audition for a role in a TV, in a, in a, a play for community college called Frankenstein. And I auditioned for the role of the monster. But this was Mary Shelley's version, right? So it was it was comprehensive. It wasn't just like some guy walking around grunting and stuff. <laughs> it was really comprehensive and it's a great play. And I auditioned, got the part. Now I'm like, I, I, I was still 19 years old and I decided I was going to produce the play off Broadway wow. in Manhattan. <laughs> And I was so ignorant, but so passionate that I didn't know I couldn't do it. And so therefore I did it. Yeah. If you get my meaning. Absolutely. And so I, uh, I put on this play. There was another play on Broadway called Dracula and we outran them. Wow. And it was just a bunch of knuckleheads from the Bronx who <laughs> went to Manhattan and put this play together. And I, you know, we had to paint the theater in order to get money, you know, like the, 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 uh, the owner of the theater said, well, you know, I can't give it to you for free, but if you paint the theater and we were like, yeah, and we're painting the theater and, you know, vacuuming and cleaning up and all that. It was the Carter theater on the, I think it was 44th street. But uh, I was so ignorant and this is, this is critical. When you don't know how difficult it's going to be, it's possible that it's not going to be that difficult. Mm -hmm. When you encumber yourself with all the weight of, oh my God, if I was to write this, then I got to meet this. And how am I going to get it to here? And I, you know what? I'm not doing anything. I Give me a that, bag of chips and a glass of wine and I'm good. Yeah, I call that analysis paralysis. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, but so, it was a great, it was a great experience, and I had a great time doing that play. That's we would actually, we, I'm sorry, we would actually go out there. So here I am, the producer um, and the uh, actor, the, the the star of the show, along with all the other star, uh, you know, actors in the show, handing out flyers, and it might have been right around the time that the ships come in i forget there's a time in new york where all the ships come in 
And then you have all the Navy guys and you have, you know, they're all wandering around in their uniforms and doing all the wonderful things they do. And we were getting, we were handing out tickets for like, you know, discounted. If you, if you, if you, if you come in with this coupon, the ticket's only $5. You know, if you don't, it's like five and a half dollars, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> it, was, it was ridiculous. But we were trying to hustle people into coming into the theater and we did you know we did okay that's awesome love that story and you studied I, I studied at Strasbourg what year did you study at Strasbourg uh let me do some uh, math um it would have been probably like 81 82 somewhere around there so I was there at the same time 81 82 uh, I was I was studying in the Young People's Program. I was I was with uh, Jeffrey Horn. I don't know if you know Jeffrey. No, I don't. And yeah. I, and, and frankly, I don't even remember who uh, my teacher was. I could see him, but I can't I can't remember his name. And for me, it was the same thing. I mean, you know, when I started studying at Strasbourg, you know, I was in a class with twenty something actresses. I was the only guy in the class. <laughs> so Woo! Lucky you. I was very motivated to get to class. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was everybody's scene. Part. That's funny. I was just telling somebody the I was just telling somebody the other day about how, you know, going to the gym makes me feel good because you go to the gym and there's like all these beautiful girls, and you're like, oh my God, if I do a couple more reps, who knows? Maybe I can and nothing ever happens. I'm I'm a happily married man, but I I imagine that to motivate me to do a couple extra reps, if you know what I mean. Good for you. And so going to class, and so I use that as a jump off point when I said to the person I was talking to about this, I said, I remember it's like when I would go to class and not acting class, any class. And there's a bunch of really, you know, attractive women and I'm motivated to get, I can't wait to get to class. <laughs> and then security shows up and I got to go away. <laughs> so so let, i want to jump ahead a little bit so now you know you you did this play you did the monster but you know when you know how does kuba and his teddy bear come along how do you get to be on stage opposite de Niro? you know how does that work out and and what what was that like you know, the rehearsal process i mean what did you what did you learn from working with an actor of that caliber so uh, I was, I had done work at the public theater before. And so I was known at the public theater. And then <clears throat> Ronaldo Pavad, this playwright who wrote Cuba and his teddy bear, he, uh, he came up and asked if we'd be interested in reading some roles just for, his re for him to hear. And so we did, me and this actress, Wanda De Jesus. Oh, yeah. She, know. I know Wanda. She was married to Jimmy Smith, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Married is the right word, but oh, yeah, they they're together. together. Yeah. Yeah. Are they still together? I think so. Okay. I think so. But. Um, Love Jimmy. So it was, it was he, she and I, and we were the only two people that were cast because then they came back and said, look, we want to put the show together. Uh, and we want you two to be in it. And I said, okay. And they started rehearsing, uh, auditioning other actors. So they had like F. Murray Abraham came in to read for the role of Cuba. And then they had, you know, three or four other people that were notable, but I can't remember right now. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, the word came out that Robert De Niro was gonna do it. And it just blew everybody that was involved in the production was like, what? That was just insane. And then so uh, De Niro comes in and, you know, he, he had just done Angel Heart. Yeah, so he still had the beard and the whole thing. And, and uh, it was probably, not probably, it was the most exciting episode of my life. Because as much as I had admired Pacino, De Niro had really kind of like almost overshadowed him in my view mm -hmm. as the guy to want to emulate or to look up to, to be inspired by. And 
Sure. So taxi he came driver. in to do the show. Taxi driver. Yeah. Raging oh my God. Bull. Raging bull. Deer hunter. Come on. <laughs> yeah. The Godfather, for God's sakes. But um, so we came in and we started rehearsing. And I could tell you the one thing there's a process in theater where you rehearse. And they, they give you a schedule, right? I know I'm not telling you, I, I'm sure you know this, but for your viewers, listeners, they, they give you a schedule so that they can rehearse certain scenes at certain times and they're not always in chronological order. They go on you know, the actor's schedule, they go on the director's schedule and then they try to kind of fix everything so that everybody's not inconvenienced as much as possible and yet still get a full day of rehearsal. So I was, see if I can get my story straight. So I was, I was preparing, I was in the audience um, while we we're all rehearsing and they had Robert De Niro was rehearsing with an actor. I believe he, it was Paul Calderon. He's rehearsing with this actor. And then there was a, uh, an ashtray on the set. And Robert De Niro was working with the ashtray. He just discovered it and he was, you know, employing it and getting used to it and, and, and trying to figure out if this is something he wants to use and all that. And the director on the project was absolutely hideous. He was the worst. I won't mention his name. You can look him up though, but he sucked. <laughs> anyway, so De Niro's working with the ashtray. He's doing stuff with the ashtray. Everybody's kind of like, okay, well, you know, let's see where that goes. Boom. Next scene that we're rehearsing, another actor comes in who was not present during that whole process watching Robert De Niro with the ashtray. In this section of the rehearsal process, this new actor comes in and takes the ashtray and throws it out the window. So this was going to be occurring prior to De Niro working with. In other words, the ashtray was important now, right? <laughs> we needed to have that ashtray. It needed to be where it was because De Niro was working on it. And the director just went, you know, he got himself all in a hiss. And he goes, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that because De Niro's using that. And De Niro was like, he was off stage and he comes out and he goes, hey, 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 don't worry about it. We'll figure something else out. It's okay. Uh, and that was the first time that I got a, some idea of how, uh, regardless of how kit gloves De Niro was treated, that he didn't want it. In fact, so the director is saying to him at some point, oh man, these stories are coming to me and they're a little fuzzy, but he's talking, the, the director is giving notes to everybody. And we're all sitting in a circle and the director is going, okay, so in this scene, you did that. And maybe you might want to try this. You might want to try that. Everything De Niro did, this director would say, oh my God, that's the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> you are the most brilliant guy ever, 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 ever. And so De Niro at one point says to the director, he says, listen, you know, I, I want this to be an equitable space for everybody. I want you to tell me if you think what I'm doing is not right. I need you to tell me that. I have to trust that you're going to tell me that. Can you do that for me? And the director goes, oh my God, you're so wonderful. What a wonderful thing. <laughs> what a gracious thing. And it was like, oh my man, God. I give up. <laughs> uh, I got a Bobby story. I had just finished doing uh, Pretty Woman with Gary Marshall. I played Julia Roberts pimp in the movie. It was a much darker film called 3000 about right. drugs and prostitution. They made it a Cinderella version. You know, most of my stuff got cut out, but it was okay because my contract was in place and I got, I got paid a lot of money for that movie. 
you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but right. shortly after, Penny Marshall uh, was doing Awakenings with with Bobby De Niro. And I had auditioned to play a Puerto Rican cab driver that picks him up and when he's sick and he's off his meds and, you know, he's, he's in a bad oh, neighborhood. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so <clears throat> I'm in Palm Springs. My agent calls me up and says, they want to screen test you. Um, they want you to come over to the studio. It's going to be Penny Marshall. Fucking grew up watching her in Laverne and Shirley, Shamil Shlamazel, <laughs> Hots and Peppers Incorporated, right? <laughs> and and Robert De Niro, my idol is a young actor, you know? Uh, uh, they want to screen test me. So I jump in my car, I fly back, I work, I prep, I do everything. I, I get on the lot, it's a New York City street, you know, sitting on that New York City street, I'm, I'm nervous. I mean, I'm going to meet, you know, Jake LaMotta, <laughs> you know, I'm going to meet, uh, you know, Travis Bickle, but I get Leonard. He's already in character in this kind of like, you know, very quiet, very, you know, just I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> you know, it wasn't my expectations of seeing the narrow. He was just very quiet and, and, and just like a like a little like old guy. He was yeah, but he was already in, in character. And there's Penny Marshall and uh you know a guy working the camera and we're screen testing so we're doing the scene where i'm telling you know this is a bad neighborhood you know let me get you out of here whatever and this is what a giving actor what, what i found from working with him was there's a scene where i go to pick him up you know he's on a park bench i said come on man you're in a bad neighborhood whatever and and i go to pick him up and he lays there dead weight and he makes me struggle to pick him up like really and in that moment it made everything real in that one little moment by him doing just making me fight so much that I grabbed him and I put him over my shoulder and I I said come on baby I'm gonna get you out of here then I'm walking him out and she didn't yell cut so I started improvising you know <laughs> I'm walking him out and then finally she yells cut you know Penny Marshall and I gingerly put down De Niro and he looks at me and goes that was good that was good <laughs> and that was it for me I literally <laughs> I, fl I, I floated out of that audition, you know, like I didn't give a shit what happened. <laughs> I didn't know the part or whatever. I got to act with, you right, know. Right, Even if you hadn't gotten it, it you won. You yeah. were already a winner. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, was, it was awesome. You know, it turns out that they didn't need, they, they cut that part out even before, you know, the movie. But it, it, was, it was just an amazing experience for me. What, what was it like for yeah, you? Yeah, um, I, I was going to say, when I... When I first met De Niro in that process with the uh, Cuban as Teddy Bear, I, I had already heard rumblings that he was a quiet guy. You know, he was uncomfortable in front of people. And, you know, I'd seen him in a couple of interviews that were terrible because he just wouldn't, you know, communicate. And so we're doing the play. My character in the play uh, was called Red Lights because he always had a cigarette in his mouth. And he was a clown. And so I was going to be his clown acting buddy. In other words, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I was, I was trying to be that character all the time with him and with everybody. But, you know, it's actually, that's who I am anyway. Uh, but I really wanted to make it a really important part of our relationship. And so I would always, always, whenever De Niro would come by, I'd tug at his shirt and say something like, what, hey, I can't wait for that suit to come back in style or whatever, you know, just <laughs> fucking with him. <laughs> Love that. And, and he said, uh, no. So he, he, he was really kind of like reticent to comply, you know? So he would, he would always laugh and he, you know, he was accessible and everything, but he wasn't going to clown back with me. And I thought that was unusual because that's a New York thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or a Northeast thing. When you clown with somebody, if somebody doesn't clown back with you, it almost seems like they're disrespecting you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... I decided that I was going to try out a, uh, a theory to see whether or not that's really who he is or is that 
who he's that he's just trying to keep everybody at bay for whatever reason you know he doesn't want anybody to get to know him or whatever and i said all right i'm going to try something so we had a green room where we would hang out and uh <clears throat> excuse me so i decided there was a certain period of time during the play where we were both, it was just the two of us in the green room. And we were there for like, you know, a half hour, 35 minutes, something like that. And I said, okay, you know what I'm gonna do? Because this motherfucker refuses to talk to me. <laughs> I said, I'm going to sit in the room and not talk to him and see what happens. <laughs> We sat in that room for 35 minutes and not a word was spoken. <laughs> it was like, I can't believe this guy can't even say like, hey, what about those chargers or, you know, whatever. Or, How's the weather? Or, nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> That's great. I mean, you've, you've had some amazing, I mean, look, I'm a De Niro fan. I'm a Pacino fan. I mean, you work with Pacino. I mean, you guys did, what did you guys do together? We did uh, uh, The Insider and we did City by the Sea, I think it was, or no, that was with De Niro. It was, it was another one that had um, a, a by the sea thing. Anyway, I did two movies with, uh, with Pacino. So and... what was that like? What's it, what's it like working with Al? What do you, what okay. do you learn? What do you, what do you, what's the big takeaway that, you know, I mean, you, you, did you learn anything, you know, working with another actor like that? Or, what's the big takeaway? So I was doing a movie. Uh, I don't know if it's a big takeaway, but it's a good story. I was doing um, The Insider with Russell Crowe and Michael Mann directed it and Al Pacino was in it. And so uh, we're doing this. I played an FBI guy that was after the Unabomber. And now Al Pacino, who's a news reporter for CBS, is reaching out to me and asking me to get information that he believes I'm holding back. So this is a phone call. And I've done phone calls. You've done phone calls. You know how that works. You do the phone, the, this, uh, the, this, uh, um, what do you call her? Script person. supervisor. Oh my God. Script supervisor. Who, uh, checks the time. And script script supervisor. supervisor. <laughs> the script supervisor. She says uh, she's doing the line reading, right? And then the other actor who's on the, who's supposed to be the other guy, will hear it six months later, two months later, three weeks later, right? It's not like you're actually in, engaged in a conversation. It's two parts of independent conversations that they're going to put together. So <clears throat> I'm on set and I'm getting ready to do this. And all of a sudden the first AD comes over to me and he says, Hey, Nestor, so uh, Michael Mann and Al Pacino want to meet with you to rehearse the scene. And I go, Oh, okay. All right. And I thought, wow, that's cool, man. That Al Pacino actually wants to rehearse with me. So that when three months later, he does his end of the phone conversation, he'll, he'll have some understanding of where we were, right? And I thought that's, that's impressive. And then we finish the rehearsal and we all go back to wherever we were. And it slowly started to occur to me that what was happening is we were shooting it concurrently. So for your listeners, that means that I was shooting in my set, making a phone call to Al Pacino, who was downstairs in his set. And we were actually going to have the conversation live. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a conversation in the story that evolves and gets heated right? He starts with a little bit of information, then it gets more and it's like, oh, you mother, well, I'm not gonna, and it's back and forth. So uh, 
I'm on my phone and I'm the one who starts the conversation. The AD gives, gives me the, the green light. I go, Al, you ready? He goes, yeah. I go, okay. Somebody yells action and I start talking and it gets heated and it gets heated. And so we did that three or four times. And the director said, Michael Mann said, let's do it again. I pick up the phone, I do it. And somewhere along the line, I stumble on my line. I forgot where I was. And so I go, oh, fuck, I'm sorry. And I hear Al Pacino on the other line going, finish your thought, finish your thought. Come on, man, finish your thought. And I was like, what, what the? And so I'm looking for my line in my head. I'm trying to get back on track and he's, finish your thought, finish your thought. And I was like, okay, all right, we got it. We get back on it. We finish, hang up. We're going to do it again. This time I pick up the phone. I go, Al, you ready? He goes, yeah. I go, okay, we start the, the thing. At one point, Al goes, what the, oh, fuck. And he hangs up because he forgot his line. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what happened to finish your thought? <laughs> Where did that go? I you love that. <laughs> I love that. You know, I, I tell my, you know, I, I, look, I have my school here for seven years and I teach the craft of acting, you know, and it's show business. I teach the business end of it. And, and, and you know, I tell my actors all the time, I says, you know, when they forget their lines and stuff like that, and they feel like start saying, sorry, sorry, I say, delete sorry from your acting vocabulary. Okay. Sorry means what? You did something wrong. All actors forget their lines. I said, I've worked with Academy Award winning actors and I've looked at them straight in the eyeballs and like they, they drew a blank and they got nothing, you know? And they go, oh, I forgot my line. I'm nervous. And I said, wait a second, hold on, time out. You're nervous? You got an Oscar? Freed me up, <laughs> you know? If, so it happens to the best, yeah. you know? If you forget your line or whatever, you know, I'd like to take it from the top. And, you know, you take it from the top. But, you know, it's it's great that, you know, actors of, you know, your caliber, Al, you know, you guys, it happens as part of acting. You know, sometimes you forget your lines. Not, not, not a big deal. I mean, you want to be prepared, but, you know, it happens. You know, what, I, what I've discovered, and I'm still battling with it because I'm not, uh, I'm not without fault on this, but... What happens to me and, and that I, I struggle with is when I get into my own head because I forgot a line and then I start thinking, oh my God, that line, I'm never going to learn that line. I'm never going to remember that line. And that becomes my albatross because I've placed it in my brain and now I can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes... I was doing a movie called Bringing Out the Dead. And Scorsese directed that, right? Yeah. And I had this big, long monologue about all this medical information. It was, it was so, it, it was heavy. It was dense. And I got in there and I did it. And I was like, you know, boom, knocked it out of the park. Uh, Scorsese gave us a couple of me and Nick Cage, a couple of uh, adjustments, physical adjustments, you know, stand over here, don't stand over there, get out of the light, this, that, and uh, go back, bang it out, bang it out. Every single rehearsal banged it out. So Scorsese says, all right, so uh, let's take a 15 minute break. We're going to do some lighting and Nestor, Nick, you guys come back and we'll see you in about 15 minutes. I go, okay. I'm walking away and the technical advisor, who's a doctor, said to me, I'm sorry, Nestor, but there's a lot of typos in the sides that you were given and we, we have to make some adjustments with words that I never even understood when I was, when I remembered them, <laughs> let alone having to forget it and now re-remember it in a, you know, in 15 minutes, it was like, <laughs> yeah, in 15 minutes. And it was like, you know, things about Narcan and, uh, psychedelic drugs and all kinds of like a lot of medical jargon. And, uh, I came back. 
after 15 minutes, banged it out. Wow. And I walked away from there and the TA said to me, man, that was pretty impressive. And I go, fuck, I don't know how I did it. I swear to God, I don't know how I did it. So then they asked me, you know, you do another take. And on the other take, I started to question myself. And then there was one word that threw me. And I thought, oh my God, all right, all right. Well, I got to get that one out of my head because I did it before I could do it again. And then it became two words, then three words. <laughs> and I started going down this rabbit hole of like self-doubt and all kinds of, and I, I actually, I, I asked Scorsese, I said, can I, can, I, can I take like a five minute break? I just need to go back to my, and he said, yeah, please go ahead. So we did, came back and got it done. But the takeaway from that is try not to get into your head. I mean, it's, it sounds almost impossible because when it's happening, it's like, you know, it's a freight train that's coming at you. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing. I mean, I tell my actors all the time, when you're in your head, you're dead. You know, when you're in your heart, you're smart. You know, if you come from play and, enjoy, you know, it's all about preparation too. I mean, you know, if you get a role playing a, a, you know, a doctor and you have all those technical terms, it's about doing the work. It's about, you know, the prep, you know, and I'm sure you did a hell of a lot of prep, but then they throw your curveball last minute and say, you know, there's some typos and you got to change it. That's hard. That is hard to do because, you know, you've done all that work and you've prepped it. And now all of a sudden you got to change it last minute. You know, I tell actors all the time, it's difficult. They think, you know, some people think acting's easy, but there's so much, you know, not only do you have a director or some script supervisor changing your dialogue, you know, five minutes before, you know, you got some wardrobe lady, you know, rolling you out. You got a hair person doing you. You got, you know, somebody telling you you're shadowing the other actor, the continuity. You got to mm -hmm. put the thing down, the drink down over there. I mean, you got like you're getting bombarded by so <laughs> much stuff. You know, it's like, you know, oh, your button, this button, you had this button open last take. You got to close it. Oh, you, you know, you got to sit down on that line. So it's, it's really, you, it, it could be overwhelming, you know, when you're getting all this information and they go, okay, quiet on the set. Okay. And action. Now you got to take all those notes right. and all that stuff and be able to put it in, you know, you get, you, sometimes you get a, one, we're losing the light. We're losing the location. You get two, you know, you got to take one take out of it and that's going to wind up in a film. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really truly about, you know, prep. So, so with respect to that, so I was doing, uh, I got, I got an offer, right. To do a TV show. I forget what it's called. Castle. Yep. Something. It could have been, it might've been, I did castle, but it might've been a different show. I played a Russian guy in castle, but in this other one, I played a Cuban FSB opera right that's fsb is like the cia in russia but he's cuban and the scene was delivered to me along with an mp3 of the dialogue that i was supposed to say and so it was just an offer you know it was like you know here so much money take it you want it and I said, I, I listened to the MP3 and it was a page and a half of Russian dialogue, completely in Russian. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I said, this is insane. When I listened to the woman who was doing my dialogue in Russian, I was like, that's insane. There's no way I could do that. No way I can do that. And so I said, no. So they offered me more money <laughs> and I said, no. Then they and they offered me more money. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, nah, nah. <laughs> they offered me more money. I said, okay, I'll do it. I, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but the money was so good. I said, I can't pass up on this. So I took the dialogue and I went down to the um, uh, Beverly Hills uh, Linguistic Center. And I had this private person ins instruct me in how to understand the language and 
how to uh, uh, explain to me what the language meant in the context in which it was said. And so I worked with her for two weeks and it was like a two hour session uh, a couple of times a week. So, and I just kept working on it, working on it, working on it, working on it. And finally I got, I got it. It worked, it made sense. And I tried it out. One of my daughter, my daughter's handicaps and we have nurses back in California. We had a couple of Russian nurses. So I tried it out on one of the Russian nurses and she goes, oh man, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how Russians roll. <laughs> I, I was so proud of myself and I do this whole thing and she looks at me and she just goes, eh, not bad. <laughs> so I go on set and it was in, in Toronto, I think. And uh, I'm working with a British actor who was gonna deliver like three Russian lines back to me uh, just to kind of show the audience that we were in cahoots, right? So, he and I were working on it while we were doing all the other scenes that weren't in Russian. We would hang out, we would go out at night and get drunk and, you know, and play around with the little scene. And all of a sudden on the day that we were gonna shoot it, the writer comes over to me at catering and says, hey, Nestor, he says, uh, so listen, you know, because the producers are really concerned about this really important information that is critical to the story might not be understood by the typical American audience. And I said, well, that sucks. That just, that's crazy. He said, we're going to have to do it in English. I go, that's, that's just, come on, man. And he was like, yeah, I don't think so. He says, maybe he talk to the director. And the director said to me, well, you know, we, we can maybe, if we have time, we'll do one take. I said, okay. So we did the scene and you'll appreciate this and anybody out there who's worked in the industry to the extent that you have will understand. When you do a scene, you're doing a scene 15, 20 times because you're doing it for rehearsal three or four times. Then you do the master, then you do the doubles, then you do the single, then you do the screamer. By the time all that's done, you've done it 10, 12, 15 times. I'm doing it all in English. And so the, the director goes, okay, cut and strike the set. We're moving on. I go, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought, can you give me, can I do one in Russian? And the director's like, ah, fuck. All right, guys, we're going to do one more. And he, uh, he lets me do it and I do it in Russian. And you know, you, you have to understand how hard that is that you've just been doing a scene in English 15 times and now you have to instantly translate that in your brain into Russian again and perform it. And I did it and uh, that's the one they used. Awesome, wow, well, I gotta see this. What, what, what? So, <laughs> You gotta, I, I wanna see it. <laughs> I gotta see it now. <laughs> yeah, I gotta figure out what that is. I gotta remember which one, it, but I'll, I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it. So, Nessa, what's your approach to the craft? You know, I mean, you're a Strasbourg guy, you're a method actor. I mean, what's, what's your approach to the craft? How do you prepare? How, you know, you get a role. I mean, you know, you were talking about getting offers. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful thing when you get offers, when you're at that point in your career where the people are just saying, Hey, we want you, we want to offer you. Here's a bunch of money. Come work on, on, on the show or the movie or whatever it is. But, you know, prior to that, you know, there was the auditioning process, you know, having to go in and, you know, audition, walk into the room. So what, what would, you know, when as a young actor, when you got that material, what's your process of, you know, getting ready for that audition? Well, you know, I went through a couple of phases in my career where I would say, you know, this bullshit of people spending, 
you know, somebody says, are, are you ready? Are you, oh, we're going to do this. And the person will say, yeah, yeah, no, I need, I need five minutes. Can everybody just sit back? I need to just breathe. <laughs> and I was like, fuck that. That's bullshit. I said, I'm going to just jump in. And I remember doing that and having some success with that. Uh, because I think it, when you just jump in, you eliminate a lot of the stuff that can get in your head. Because now you've given yourself enough time to kind of get worked up. And oh my God, and where am I? And what am I doing? And as opposed to just knowing your lines and then just jump in and do it. But that has limited success because you're, you're not working from an organic position. You know, it's, it's more external than it is internal when you're doing it that way. As opposed to taking a minute, maybe you don't have to take five minutes, but you can take a minute and sit back and say to yourself, okay, well, who am I and where am I and where did I come from and where am I going to? And let's start from there. And that gives you a greater grounded place from which to work. And ultimately, you know, so I'm giving you the before and after. The, the other one, just jumping in and just doing it has a certain satisfaction, but I think at the end of the day, you don't really feel as uh, satisfied with what you've done. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it loses a, a bit of its soul. It loses a, a little bit of its heart. And so at the risk of maybe getting into your head too much, the payoff is that it's, it's much more enriching, whether the audience sees it or not. You know, it's, it's, if, if I walk away from, and, and I'll, to just slightly make a little turn here, I go to auditions and I'll do what I wanted to do at the audition. So I have this thing in my head as I'm working on it and I'm saying to myself, okay, this is how I envision this character doing its thing. If I walk out of that audition and I feel like I achieved that, I won. Yep. Regardless of whether I get the part or not. And conversely, I've been to auditions where I sucked. And I know that I sucked. And then I get the job and I'm like, come on. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, I know. You're going to give me the job after that shitty audition? I know. I've been there. I've been, I remember like leaving the audition, beating myself up, going, man, I sucked. And then the phone rings and my agent goes, hey, you got that job. I go, what? What? What room were they in, man? You know, but. <laughs> I guess you know <laughs> your 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 worst was better than the other guy's best. <laughs> so whatever. Right. Right. I know. Well, it makes you question, right? I mean, if they yeah. if if they think that that's a good aud that that's a worthy audition, then you have to question their taste and go. You know, I don't want to be a member of any club that wants me to be a member. Right, that kind of thing. <laughs> if if I'm gonna suck that bad and you're gonna hire me, I'm not sure I want to do this. <laughs> you ever deal with nerves? Nerves are my middle name, bro. Yeah. How do you deal with yeah. that? How do you do? I mean, listen, I'm going on stage, being waiting for your cue, you know, uh, on Broadway or working up against, you know, some of these heavy duty directors, Scorsese, working with Pacino, De Niro. I mean, you know, I could, I would say that's a nerve, a little nerve wracking, you know, you want to, you want to be able to deliver, you know, when they, they say action, how do you deal with that? What's your, you know, approach to dealing with, you know, the, the nerves? You know, I think that the, the, uh, and I haven't completely, um, slayed that beast right it still happens it never really goes away 
And I think that it's a tribute. And this is not to just like, you know, make myself sound good. But I think if you, if you, when you're no longer concerned, which is a mild version of nerves, um, if you're not concerned about what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, what your approach is, then you're not really trying. I think, you, I think, I think it's healthy to be nervous. You know, nerves are, uh, you have uh, nerves for different reasons, right? You have the fight or flight thing. Uh, but if, 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 you, if you can go into something that significant, you know, to portray another character, to, 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 to move people, that's the art, right? That's why we do what we do is so that we can move people, whether it's moving them through laughter or moving them through sadness. Um, if you're not concerned about whether or not you're going to achieve that, I don't know, I don't know. You know, I haven't given it a whole lot of thought, but it seems to me that I have friends of mine who are actors who do well. Um, and they're, they're, they're never nervous, never. I guarantee you De Niro's nervous. I guarantee you Pacino's nervous. I guarantee you, I promise you. Love that. See, but you, have to, you have to figure out how to navigate that energy to make it productive. So I tell my actors, I, I don't call it nervous. I call it excitement. You're excited, man. Delete nervous yeah. from the vocabulary. It's excitement. Yeah. And, and you know what? That's like batteries for an actor. You want that. You know, if you channel that, it's it, it's like, you know, Michael Jordan with three seconds left on the clock. The adrenaline's pumping. You get into that laser focus and you get into the zone. If you can channel that, if you get in your head, you're fucking dead. But if you can truly be in the moment and and you know you've already you're in that place and you're talking to a real person you're fighting for a real need and you're in that you know and you're in that world you're not in your head you're you're in your heart and you're in play and you're having a good old time because i mean i think that's what acting is 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 play and i believe it's your instrument telling you you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing when you get that little heart palpitation, you get that little excitement, that's your instrument going, you're on the right fucking path. Right, right. That's where I was going when I said that whole fight and flight thing is that um, that those, those connotations are negative, right? Mm -hmm. Fight or flight. But it's really the same kind of energy when you get on a roller coaster that you know you're going to walk away from. You know you're not going to die. But the excitement is just so explosive so that's where you can take that it's the same energy yeah the fight or flight thing and being on a roller coaster is the same energy it's how you utilize it and contain it and uh and do good things with it rather than you know shit your pants <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, you know i tell the story i tell my actors you know it's 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 two kids waiting on the line to go on the roller coaster and they're both sta standing there and they're really excited. And, you know, they walk up the, 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 you know, the staircase and then whatever. One kid is like so excited. I can't wait. I can't wait to ride the roller coaster. I can't wait. And they ride the roller coaster and they have this amazing ride and they get off and they go, I want to go again. The second kid, he's feeling the same exact thing, but all of a sudden he gets into his head and he starts thinking, I'm going to die. The, the bolts are coming out of the thing, you know, I'm not, you know, and, and gets up there and does not ride the ride. And that's the difference. It's being able to go, I'm excited. I'm not nervous. And, and using that and knowing that it's going to be a fun ride if you just go with it and, and use it. I just, did, I just did a little thing in New York uh, last week. First time in two years during the pandemic because of my daughter and you know, she has a compromised immune system and all that. Uh, I didn't work for two years. So I went out and did this little, little movie and it was a character that, um, you know, I wasn't necessarily 
completely familiar with, but um, experiences that I've had where it was a very emotional, a lot of emotional things going on. And I just spent most of my time trying to contain myself. Uh, and, you know, I'm a New York, Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx. I grew up in places where if, some, if, if somebody saw you cry, they beat the shit out of you. That's just the way it was. So for me to find myself in such an emotional place uh, in this role, in this little movie, it was just so... Uh, uh, it was it was enlightening to me that I found myself surprised that I could be that on the on the verge of and you know I don't I don't want to sound like I'm pounding sand up people's ass I'm I'm mediocre at best. And occasionally I have a, a, a little moment where I can even like actually watch and go, oh, oh, that was actually pretty good. For the most part, I'm a real tough critic on myself. But this experience in, in New York uh, last week was really uh, special. And I think what happened was, I, I found myself, uh, completely unen unencumbered by lines. You know, a lot of times lines can get in your way because you're trying so hard to not forget them or get them in the right order or whatever. But there was something about this particular um, experience that allowed me to just like, I don't care. I don't care. They're in there somewhere. They'll come out when it makes sense for them to come out. And those lines all came out when they were supposed to come out because I gave myself the freedom to not worry about that. Right. And I, I think that's a lesson. That's a beautiful lesson, you know, and you also allowed yourself to be vulnerable, you know, and vulnerability is your right. strength. You know, we grew up in a in, in neighborhood, the Bronx, Brooklyn or whatever. You couldn't, yeah, be crying, you know, <laughs> men don't cry. But, you know, as an actor, you have to be vulnerable. You have to bear your soul. You have to take your shit and make art out of it. I mean, you know, I tell my actors all the time, everything that's ever happened to you in your whole life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all that stuff. That's your goal, man. That's what makes you unique, special take that and and make art out of it hand it over bear that's yourself. the magic you know the magic is in yeah the magic is in being able to deliver emotionally to things that other people wish they could but for some reason can't you know for me one of the most uh, emotional experiences that i've ever had watching movies and I'll give you Taxi Driver as an example. When Taxi Driver, when De Niro walks out of the diner and he meets Peter Boyle and they have this exchange. I don't know if you remember it, but yeah. they have an exchange. And De Niro looks at him and there's this close-up and he's looking at him and he goes, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just some things. They're, you know, I'm thinking about things and I, I don't know. I don't know. And you can see his eyes and it just, it's a man who wants to explode, but he can't. And when you as an audience member see that, you go, my God, how many times have I wanted to explode and I can't? Then you go with them on that journey and that's the beauty of it. That's magical. And, and, and I love Peter Boyle in this. He's like, you know, I mean, De Niro's trying to go to him almost like a therapist, you know, for an answer. <laughs> and he's giving him nothing, zero. When you have to go to Peter Boyle for therapy, <laughs> you're in trouble. Uh, uh, it's a <laughs> classic moment. Love that moment. If you were to go back, right, if you could go back and talk to the younger you and give yourself some advice, you know, some advice about life advice or the business or what would that be? 
You know, if I had to give you some advice, it's going to be dull and boring advice for your younger viewers out there that are aspiring to be actors. But what I would say is, as much as I love acting, and I do love acting, nothing is more important to me than my family. And, uh, and I cherish my family. And, and I, I, I am very proud of how hard I work Sometimes not entirely successful, but I work really hard at being a good father to my children. Uh, I grew up in a broken home. My dad was rarely around, but when he was around, I'd rather he had not have been. But uh, so that that's something that I hold dear to my heart, that I don't let this business of show business to get in the way of my being a good father and a good husband. And that's, you know, I mean, there's a place for everything and, and, and acting is wonderful. It's, it's, it's fine financially um, gratifying. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of people in my world that, uh, have put themselves into positions, whether uh, it was uh, intentionally or, or otherwise, that find themselves struggling between their career and their family. And I won't let that happen. That is beautifully said. I, I agree. Listen, I am, you know, I, I had father wasn't around and when he was around he was you know an alcoholic abusive you know he beat the crap out of my mother i wish he wasn't around you know i mean it's just i didn't you know wait a minute what was your father's name was it nesta serrano <laughs> i'm well, a the, junior you know, by the, the way the, 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 the biggest biggest thing was you know i learned what not to do uh, you know not uh, you know i i i'm for me i'm one of my greatest accomplishments the greatest roles i've ever played in my life is father you know, I, I have a son and he's 14 years old and I feel, and I got a beautiful wife and I have an amazing marriage. And, you know, I learned what not to do. And now, you know, I never had a dad that showed up to any of my sporting events or whatever, you know, now I'm, I'm my son's, I was a soccer coach. I was his football coach. You know, I'm, I'm highly involved. I, I haven't missed a game, you know, I'm there all the time because I know what it feels like not to have a dad there, you know? So I agree with hundred percent in this business, you know, listen, the fame, the money, that's a double-edged sword, the success, this business is a roller coaster. You know, it's got its ups and downs, you know, one minute you're the, you know, the greatest thing. And, you know, I mean, listen, you know, we both have a friend that passed RD call, you know, our, RD was a dear friend of mine. You know, I, I work with him. You know, we were in, we were in at the actor's gym together. We were on stage together. We did an episode of diagnosis to murder. Together. Maybe that's where I saw you. Did I maybe? Huh? I'm sorry, but maybe that's where I met you. Did I ever meet you at the, at the gym? No, I don't think so. Okay. I, 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 was, I, I went there a bunch of times. Yeah. But just I mean, to I was, watch. Yeah. I was, I was at the actor's gym. I mean, this is a long time ago. I was, you know, long, long, long time ago, you know, when the actor's gym first okay. kind of came out here, but you know, you know, here's a guy like RD that had an amazing resume. You know, he did, I don't know, every Sean Penn film. I mean, he worked with some of the greatest, you know, directors and, you know, I mean, the guy, you know, I, I, I've watched many, many a career, you know, guys like my friend, Dickie Bacallion that passed away too, you know, that played my father on a TV show. These guys got IMDB credits, you know, a mile long and and then they stop working you know they stop you know and and the business has changed drastically from when we get got in you know in the early 80s you know uh, you know now there's the, you know this old technology self tape auditions you know a lot of those old the older guys you know that weren't they didn't make that shift to self taping and the the online stuff and moving their demo reels and everything online because you know they're old school you know they so a lot of those guys kind of got lost in the shuffle some great actors that kind of fell off because they didn't kind of move with the times this whole you know i mean how do you feel about and some 
and some of them moved a lot slower than others. And RD, I used to joke to RD, I'd say, RD, if it was up to you, you would hitch your, your horse to the front of your apartment, go inside and uh, have a cup of coffee and not even know what a computer is. He was such a, He's a cowboy like from another era. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's, it's, it's sad to me when you see that the, the business has changed drastically. So you listeners out there, you have to be, you know, you got to be online and you got to have your presence out there. You got to have your demo reel. You got to have your pictures. You got to have all that stuff because, you know, now it's casting directors. They look at a little computer screen and they hit a thumbnail, you know, of your headshot and then they click on it and to see, you know, your demo reel or they click on it to see your self tape audition. So, you know, master that shit because that's how you're going to work in a business. So let me ask you a question, Billy, because I'm of the opinion, but I'm, I'm ignorant to like the, 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 the happenings of today as a struggling actor, young, new. But when I was a kid, I literally, I would have to send out, I, I would send out eight by tens every day, uh, uh, once a month. And I would send out postcards once a week to the same casting people. And then I would knock on doors, literally take my, my resumes, put them in a bag, a messenger envelope, and go knock on doors and just hand them, slip them through the door. Nowadays, and auditioning, you know, I, will, I, I would be a part of, uh, I forget what they call the process, but you would have um, like a scene night. What was it called? Maybe I, for, I, I forgot, but you would have a theater would put a production of like six or seven different plays. One act. And everybody would do, huh? Like one act plays? No, it wasn't even a one scene. act plays. It was almost like scenes. Mm -hmm. And it was literally just to audition for a bunch of agents and managers and people like that. And they would come in and they'd watch, you know, 20, 30 actors, um, perform in a, an hour and a half. And it was almost like being at, at open mic for yeah, like a showcase. Yes. And then, so you, you'd end up, you know, it's a, it's a lot better to go and see a show where you might see 20 actors performing than it is to go see a one man show or, a, you know, a two hander for uh, an hour and a half. So they got more for their buck because they were able to see so many more people perform. But we would do that kind of stuff, you know, and painting theaters and vacuuming floors so we could do shows. That's the hustle. That's the grind. That's that's the way you you, you the success that you had was because you were pounding the pavement. You were knocking on doors. You were sending out those headshots. You were sending out those reminder postcards. You were doing that's the work. Now it's different now. Now it's a digital age. So now you you know you got your little but, but Mike. My, my question to you was going to be, is it easier now because you have so much access or is it harder because everybody has the same access? You know, I think it's, it's easier now because you do have, you know, you have this cool little device in your pocket and this is like a little movie studio, man. Back in the day, we'd have to book a part to get a little footage on ourselves, you know, and go to Jan's video and have them edit our edit into our demo reel you know now you know you can create you know anything you, you can write on this thing you can shoot on it you can edit it you can have your own youtube channel you can have a uh real your stuff on reels i mean you you can really kind of show your talent right but yes but but so does everybody else correct but you got to so you know, back in, back in the old days the guy who hustled the most maybe got the most benefit now nobody really has to hustle all that much it's just a question of you know who's willing to put it out there but you know what i'm saying is that my neighbor across the street from me in baltimore maryland who doesn't know anything about acting could put together a demo reel and end up you know going viral on something and next you know she's on the tonight show and she's got a tv series 
Yeah, I mean, that kind of shit happens. So, but you could still, you know, what you did, the pounding of the pavement. Well, you know, now, you know, there's the internet, there's IMDB Pro, there's, you know, you can reach out, you can find emails, you can put your materials together, have, you know, your, 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 the right headshot that really represents your cast ability, maybe a piece of footage of you playing that. Let's say you can play a detective. Great. Have a piece of footage of you playing a detective, show them, you know, don't leave it to their imagination. There it is. Boom. There's a detective. You know, if you see yourself as a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, have that and, and then pound the pavement, send out those emails, send out those those reminders. Hey, I'm out. You got to bang on the door. You know, you got to, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. You know, you could, you could post some shit on Instagram, but that doesn't, that's not going to get you found. It's you really kind of, you know, banging on the doors and making those calls. You know, you still got to hustle, you know, but you, now you just have a, a, another place to do it. There's, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, I mean, back when I came out to Hollywood, there was ABC, NBC, and CBS. I started the fucking Fox network with 21 jump street and my TV show that I, with Matthew Perry. I mean, we literally started the network, you know, there was women in women in prison, 21 jump street and married with children, you know, that was it. Now there's everything Hulu, Amazon, you know, I mean, there's so much, so oh many God. places, there's so much, so much. This is, this, this is literally, this is the golden age of, of television. You know, yeah. they used to call it back in the fifties. This is it. This is it. There is so much good shit on TV right yeah. now. And it they need just actors. It my mind. And all these, all these shows need actors. So, you know, there's work out there. So it's, it's, a, it's really who's going to hustle? Who's going to grind? Who's going to go out there and get their grussel on? You know, the hustle and that grind. And, and don't take no for an answer. And you know what? Get some fucking no's. Get a lot of no's. Every no brings you closer to a yes. You're in the game. Get, get as many no's as possible. <laughs> You know, but just every opportunity you get, just do your best work, leave a piece of your soul behind. And that cast and director will remember you. You might may not be right for this role, but you know, you made a fan. I'm gonna bring him back. You know why? Because you made them look good. You go in there, you shit the bed. You know what? They're not gonna bring you back. That door's gonna close. So it's all about really truly being pre preparation and and grinding it out. And right. And it's important for your younger viewers or your, 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 your listeners who are kind of new to the business to understand that a casting director is an employee, just like you might be if you get hired. So a, a casting director gets, uh, gets paid to bring people in for your producers and directors to view. The more success, every time a, a, an actor walks in and does a good job is a thumbs up from that casting director. She's thinking, or he's thinking, man, I scored. Even if they don't want him, they know that I brought in talent. They know that I brought in somebody qualified that's even if they don't get this particular job, did a good job and that makes me look good. And at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. Everyone wants to look good. Exactly. And it's also about, you know, reputation. I mean, listen, you've, you've been around the block. You've been in, you've worked, you know, if you had a bad rep, if you are a hard actor to work with, you know what? I don't think you're going to be working again with a uh, Pacino or De Niro or whatever, you know, or Scorsese, you know, the, you, you get a reputation in this business. So you want to have a really good reputation. Yeah. You, you want to be the guy that gets there early. You're the last one to leave. It's yes, sir, standing by. You're not the, the clown eating donuts by craft services. You know, I, I treated like, you know, the set like the military. Yes, sir, stepping in, stepping out, you know. Very much like the military. Yeah, you know, you got to you gotta be standing by. It's time's money. The clock's ticking. You don't want to be the actor. Oh, we can't find our lead actor. Where is he? Oh, yeah. so I'm walking over there, you know. No, you, no. you want to let people, you go to the first day, they say, listen, I'm going to, I'll be stepping out for a minute. I got to make a call. I'll be right there. You need me. I'm right there. This is where I'm at, you know, and, and it's about relationships and, and people like working with you. I mean, you know, you're a working actor. You've been a, a you've had an amazing career and, and I'm looking forward to see what's to come because, you know, I think you truly, I, I, you know, I think you're very talented. I mean, I think you're one of those, you're a character. Actor. I mean, you play the cops, you play the bad guys, you know, you and you're, you're great at all of them. Which one's your favorite to play? The, the good guys or the bad guys? Bad guys. 
Yeah, always, always more fun. <laughs> you know, the thing about the plan, the good guys is, although that's changed now after Dexter and Breaking Bad, where the good guys are the bad guys and, you know, everything's gotten a little muddied. But back in the old days, when it was just, you know, four or five, if you, if you want to include the CW, five networks, uh, you, if, if you were one of the good guys on the show, you represented the network. You were the guy that the network said, we are expecting the viewers to understand that this represents us. He's the good guy, she's the good guy. And what happens with that is, and you did an episode of Jack. Yes. Right? Yep. Worst experience of my life. And I'll tell you about this one time. <laughs> But I was supposed to be the captain of a ship. Something happened. I, my situation got compromised. Anyway, in the storyline, I end up getting into trouble with Jag because I wouldn't do what they wanted me to do. So when I first came on the set, I remember... Uh, feeling so good man i was so like just this is going to be awesome i love the role i love this i love that it was all just uh, the the language was good and then um i came in i did my first line and i had to do a line and i'm gonna make it up but you'll you'll get my point so let's say i say to somebody hey that's really good it could be, uh, hey, that's really good, but it could be better, right? That was the line. I'm making it up, but let's say that was it. So instead of saying, hey, that could be good, but it could be better, I said, hey, that could be good, but it could be better. I took that little pause, right? And I was so happy with that little pause. It just made me feel like, yeah, it gave it a, a bit of like humanity, you know? It, it said something about my character. The director said to me, you can't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> so why? You're a captain. And do you remember Popeye on Jags? Yeah. Popeye, right? So he was the TA. He was the guy who made sure that you did everything by the book because Jag was in bed with the Navy. They gave him free shit so that they can get, you know, on all kinds of aircraft carrier. They got a lot of free shit by making sure they made the Navy look good. And Popeye's job was to make sure that you all complied with making the Navy look good. And so somehow they perceived that my pause, that was good, but it could be better. That pause made the captain not look good. I remember at one point I'm going through some like crazy shit and I take this, the phone rings and I pick up the phone. I go, hello, uh, Nestor, you, you, you know, that, that thing you did with your breath. No, that's not good. We can't use that. I was like, what the fuck? It was the worst experience of my career. I swear to God, Jag, I will never forget it. I got a funny Jag story. Go. All right. So. I auditioned for JAG. I get 12 pages of material. It's uh, three scenes. I study the three scenes. You know, I know I'm backwards and forwards, forwards and backwards. I'm ready to go, you know? But the third scene was my favorite scene. So now I'm in a producer session, Don Belisario and all the, all the, the executives are there, right? And I do the first scene and the second scene and, and I feel really good. And they say, okay, thank you very much. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, I'd like to do the third scene, <laughs> you know? I want to do the third scene. The third that's scene. the one you've been... That's the one that... That's I was the ready. one you that, want. You... Uh, the okay. third scene, I, 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 I argued with them to let me do the third scene, right? Let me do that third scene. And, of course, I get halfway through the third scene, I draw a fucking blank. <laughs> my sides are rolled up in my pocket. The head fell out. I draw a complete no. blank. Complete blank halfway through the third scene. <laughs> so now Belisario goes, they look, he, he goes, you say, he says, he says, you should have stuck with the, the second scene. <laughs> <laughs> you should have quit while you were ahead. You your head. So I, 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 I left the room with my tail between my legs, you know, 
And uh, my agent called me and he says, you got the part. <laughs> so I'm on set and I go, I asked the producer, I said, what, what happened? <laughs> I got the part. He goes, he goes, he said, kid, you should have quit while you were ahead. He says, I knew you were the guy after the, sec the second take, the second scene. I didn't need to see the third scene. Note to self, when they say <laughs> thank you very much, it's over. Thank you. Thanks for seeing me. Have a great day. Walk out. Don't push it. You never know what they're thinking, man. But I was like, yeah. no, I got to prove. I got to do that third scene, you know? So valuable lesson. Listen, Nestor, I can't yeah. thank you enough, brother, for, for jumping on. You know, I know it's late on, uh, where you're at and, uh, you know, just sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. And I, I truly thank you from the bottom of my heart for jumping on. Thank you, Billy. And I hope that maybe one day you and I will work together. I would love that. Yeah. Let's put awesome. it out there. See what happens. Well, it's going to happen. We just put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Good to talk to you, man. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you. All right. Take Thank care. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see more, you can click here to watch the full podcast. Please make sure you subscribe. Please leave a comment if you have any questions you'd like me to answer on a future podcast. Make sure you turn on the notification bell so you'll be notified next time I post a video. And I will see you next time. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.